Hello everyone, this is Monica Lupion and today I'm going to cover the last part of the membranes lecture which is related to the mass transport in ultrafiltration. If you recall the ultrafiltration uh, is one of the options that we can have with membranes depending on the particle size. In this case ultrafiltration if you recall we were filtering very tiny particles which were, let's say, in the middle range on the capacity of membranes. The uh, driving force in this particular case is the pressure different, and we normally operate with a delta P around 1 or 8 bars. We, use, we normally use water as a solvent, and we are able to retain uh, microsolutes and colloids depending on the particle size, as mentioned uh, one minute ago. There are different applications for ultrafiltration. One example that we're going to see today is the dairy industry. We're going to see that in the milk processing, uh, we use ultrafiltration to purify milk and to provide, let's say, homogeneous consistency to milk. And also some biological processes like, for, instance, for example, um, the hemodialysis. This is the example that I just mentioned. It's a, a milk processing system or a factory. In this case, we, uh, well, the, the factory received the raw milk that is normally put in the storage system. We then go to a pasteurization process where we kill some of the bacteria that we don't want to be present in the milk. And then we need to separate sometimes depending on the type of milk, we might need to reduce the fat concentration or some other properties. And with that, we can go farther to our ultrafiltration plant to really Hello everyone, this is Monica Lupion and this is the third part of the lecture regarding membranes. Today I'm going to cover mass transfer in ultrafiltration. If you recall, this is one of the options uh, using membranes depending on the particle size of the substance that we want to separate. Ultrafiltration was something around in the middle range. So the particles are tiny, but they are not as tiny as, for example, the uh, osmosis. Uh, the driving force of this technology is the pressure difference. And we normally operate in the order around 1 or 8 bars in that range. We normally uh, filtrate um, water. So we use water as the solvent. And this technology is able to retain to filter microsolutes and colloids depending on the particle size diameter, as I mentioned. There are different applications for ultrafiltration. One is the dairy industry, and I'll show you next um, a diagram of a milk processing uh, factory. And there are other applications, like for instance, uh, biological. And we're going to see also an example. This is the diagram that I just mentioned is the milk processing unit. This uh, facility well it receives water, uh, milk, sorry, that is usually put in, the, in storage. And then we go to some purification process like pasteurization to eliminate some of the bacteria, for example, that we don't want to be present in, in milk. And depending on what we want to do, we can even go further to ultrafiltrate milk so we can get a higher concentration in some um, uh, substances like for instance uh, fat or we can even you know concentrate the milk even farther let's imagine that if we want to do, to do milk powder we can separate the water content of milk from the rest of the nutrients and if we, in this ultrafiltration plant, in this case, we don't want to use, let's say, conventional processes like um, distillation or anything like that, because that can destroy the properties of the nutrients. 
and this is uh, the use of membrane could be really appropriate in this case because we can separate water from the nutrients without destroying the properties of the um, substances. Uh, we see that in ultrafiltration, because of the way it is uh, operating, the uh, flux can change a lot with the concentration of pressure. If you think about a membrane, it's a physical barrier, as I mentioned. If we want to filter something that has a higher concentration of impurities, what happens is that after a while, after a certain time, there is a layer um, comprised of impurity molecules or impurity particles deposited over the surface of the membrane. So really this physical, this physical layer that can appear will of course make the filtration more difficult because the delta P, the delta pressure, will have to be bigger in order to help the flow to go through the membrane plus this impurity layer that is being formed. Um, and, and we can see it very, very easy, I think, in the graph on your left. In this graph, you can see the relation between the flux with the delta P that we apply. The first case with pure water, there is no impurities you see that the higher the pressure that we apply, the higher could be the flux. But then if we consider the presence of impurities, in this case, latex, we see that with a concentration of impurities of about 1%, this curve that still can, um, let's say the membrane can operate in a similar manner as when we only have uh, pure water, but in general, in order to get the same flux, we will have to apply a higher pressure. And the situation becomes more critical as we increase the concentration of impurities. If we go down and we pay attention to the curve of 20% concentration, we see that um, in order to achieve, let's say, 10 gal per square feet a day flux, we have to apply around 20 psi compared to, I would say, 2 or 3 psi if we only have pure water flux. But moreover, when we have this high concentration, there is certain point where no matter how much pressure we apply, the molar flux is not going to increase because the membrane is saturated, that's what it's called. So you see that, well, with these ultrafiltration and in general with membranes, it's very important to consider the driving force, but also the concentration in both sides. And if we have a situation like 20% impurities, maybe what we have to do is to filter in different phases so not, you know, like, like different steps and, and not try to filter all in once. Um, we, we can use um, simplify equation in the case of the ultrafiltration. We call in this case polarization when, when it comes to ultrafiltration. We can do a similar analysis as we did in filtration with gases, so I'm not going to repeat that. But as I mentioned, we can make some assumptions that will simplify further, even further, the uh, equation of the molar flux. Let's imagine how the, the process will be, and this is a diagram. So in one side of the membrane, we have a feed, a feed um, with a certain concentration that we can call bulk concentration, CV. Then there is the boundary layer, which has a thickness delta, and there is a variation uh, of the concentration within this boundary layer. Then there is the membrane, and on the other side is the permeate. We can define this permeate as C sub E. 
which is a concentration on this side of the of the membrane. And we define as well um, the total flux J, which is similar to the um, molar flux that we normally define as N, just the units can be a little bit different, but it's the same concept. We can apply the same conservation equation as we did in the previous example, and, and we assume a steady state, no accumulation and no chemical reaction we can um, uh, simplify the conservation equation. Um, the, the derivative of the J in relation to X is equal to zero. That is that the total flux is constant. Then we can define the boundary conditions in order to solve the integration of the thick rate. In this particular case, I'm gonna go back. When the white is equal to zero, the concentration is CV. You can see it here when at the beginning of the boundary layer, when y is equal to zero, the concentration is uh, the bulk concentration, while y is equal to delta, the concentration is Cm. Okay, and we um, also can apply some assumptions. I don't want to go into the details because I think it's not important here. And as a result, we can define the equation that is box in, in red. In this equation, I also um, consider the um, mass transfer convective, the convective mass transfer phenomena. That's why there is a K included in this equation. And as a result, the molar flux is equal, is a function of the mass transfer coefficient K and the relation between the concentration of the element A in the um, boundary layer minus the concentration of the element A in the permeate over the concentration uh, of the bulk minus the concentration of the permeate. And here we have defined the mass transfer coefficient as the relation between the diffusivity over the thickness of the boundary layer. We can go a little bit farther and apply this gel layer model when it has the same starting point as the equation that I just mentioned, that is the molar flux is equal to the convective mass transfer coefficient k and a function of the different concentrations. And if we apply this gel layer model, we can assume that the concentration of the permeate is very small because the efficiency of the membrane is really, really good. So let's say that whatever passes the membrane is pure, is almost clean. So we can say that the concentration of the element A in, in the permeate is very, very small and therefore we can assume that this concentration P is negligible. And with that, that means that the concentration of the membrane is equal to the concentration of the this gel layer. So if we play around with the previous equation, we can define the limit or what will be the maximum amount of a molar flux that will go through the membrane. And it's given by this equation here as a function of the convective mass transfer coefficient K, the concentration of the, of the gel layer and the concentration of the bulk. Um, these were, uh, you see an example, when we can apply these uh, layer gel layer model, usually the, the, there is an indication of the concentration of the membrane, the concentration, sorry, the concentration of the gel layer and the concentration of the bulk. So you will be able to directly apply this equation. If you want to make a representation, graphical representation of the equation that we just saw, you see this red line will be the equation for uh, ultrafiltration. And when we uh, follow further, or we, we imposed that the permeate concentration of the element A is very, very small, we can continue with this yellow line and this will be the limit. The limit is defined by this gel layer concentration. 
And well, you see that in this equation there is um, the well one um, parameter that uh, is not really defined, and is the mass transfer coefficient. We know this can be a critical parameter, and this can be uh, really tricky to estimate, really complex to estimate. We cover some equations in uh, lecture 15, I believe, to determine the value of the mass transfer convective coefficient. And in the case of membranes, uh, we can use the same approach. We can define the shared number as a function of the diameter of the, of the, of the membranes, um, as a function of the K and diffusivity. So if we're able to calculate somehow the shared number, since we know the diameter and we know the diffusivity, we will be able to calculate the value of K. There are different approaches, different empirical equations to calculate this shared number and therefore this uh, mass transfer coefficient. Um, but um, this is just another example. If in the problems that we're going to see in class, you can use the uh, empirical equations that we covered in previous, in previous lectures, which, um, just to refresh your memory, are always a function of the Reynolds number and the Smith number, if it's a turbulent uh, flow, or a function of the Grassoff number and the Smith number, if it's a natural flow. Um, I think that's it. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know.